It's the hardest thing in business development is getting the brand new client. And But once we have it, we're very good at working with our clients. Hello and welcome to The Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And today I am speaking with Trevor Abramson, FAIA, founding partner of Abramson Tiger and Abramson Architects. And he has over 30 years of commitment to his craft. Trevor strives to promote the art of architecture by evoking a deeply felt emotional and spiritual response from clients, critics, and the public. His multifaceted practice, initially focused on single family residences, now encompasses religious commissions, educational facilities, and a numerous assortment of commercial buildings, as well as healthcare and medical. Over 300 of his projects have gained significant acclaim from the international architectural community and have undoubtedly advanced the profession. He has won awards such as the Quincy Jones Memorial Award for Design Excellence, Design Entry to the Hall of Evolving Life Competition, the LACMA, the National AIA Honor Design Award for his first Presbyterian Church of Encino, and he has had eight different Abson buildings featured in prestigious art institution tours and 10 different Abson buildings featured in local and national AIA tours. In this episode, it's a brilliant conversation, we took on the topic of how to worry about a recession. So in Trevor's 30 plus years of experience, he goes into discussing how to plan for a recession. We look at two strategies for moving into a new sector, and we discuss the problems and the advantages with having a diverse portfolio of work. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Trevor Abramson. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Trevor, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? Very good. Really uh, looking forward to this and uh, should be an interesting discussion. Brilliant. So you are the founding principal of Abelson Architects in Los Angeles. Um, You guys have been going for quite a while. How long has the practice been going for? The practice is now in its 37th year. Um, I started in 1987 at the ripe old age of 26 years old and um, and plugging away at it now. We've grown from just myself and to 37 people in the firm right now. Uh, Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And you've got um, work in numerous different sectors. I know you've worked with tech companies. There's a lot of resident, beautiful residences you've done in, uh, in glamorous locations in, in California. There's uh, multi-housing, there's residential, um, a very diverse portfolio of, of work. Um, and, you know, I know you, you worked in the medical sectors as well. Um, Correct. And, and very interesting that you, I'm assuming then that you set the practice up pretty much straight out of university. You know, I did. I, um, I went to, from USC, I came from South Africa. That's my accent in case you and everybody's wondering. Came to the States at a young age of 18 years old and went to USC where I got a bachelor degree. And then immediately thereafter, I, I went to Columbia University in New York and got a master's degree and lived and worked in New York and Manhattan for about three and a half years. I worked for Philip Johnson, um, famous old, old late architect. Um, and, um, and actually, our offices there were in the Seagram building. So I was a young architect that was pretty Perfect. fantastic, designed by Mies van der Rohe. And, and, and back then, you could still go to the cafeteria in the basement and um, and and eat in the Four Seasons restaurant where uh, they had dirty martinis. Although I was too young to really understand that and enjoy <laughs> it, um, so that was my my New York experience. And then I, I came back to LA and worked for a firm here called Welton Beckett, 
um, very established, famous firm, and then they um, they were merged out with LB and and have been since merged out, bought out by AECOM. But I worked there for a year and a half, and during that that year and a half, I got a project to design a house for one of my parents' friends, and I did that as a moonlight job. And then that very quickly led to another house for another parent's friend. And when the two houses went into construction, I I said, I can't do this and work ethically for somebody else. So I went out and and, uh, started my own firm. I was 26 years old at the time. And then grew up just doing single family houses and some remodels and very slow, slow haul. That's the... Even though I was very young, it's the long approach to, mm-hmm. to starting an architectural firm. Um, but I don't know, and a few years later, five, ten years later, I got invited by one of my residential clients to do their offices. And another one to threw me in, in the hat to design their church. And I actually won the project. And that was a, a, a remodel of the first Presbyterian Church of Encino. Mm-hmm. We won um, AIA National Honor Award for it and, and various other awards. And and so that was the beginning of branching out from single family residential to other yeah. sectors. And now, um, all these years later, we do about 25% single family residential and the rest is commercial and institutional and um, and medical work. So that, that's the, the brief summary of the trajectory of the firm. So yeah, so so starting off really, really young, and not necessarily having much time to learn from any other architects, if you like. So there's a lot of kind of finding and figuring it out by yourself. Was there any <clears throat> lessons learned when you were working at um, at Philip Johnson? Were you were you involved with him much, or what was the practice like there? You know, when I was at Philip Johnson, I got to meet him uh, over probably three times in a year let's say um and you know i was the uh, the low on the rung on the totem pole um literally my job was um doing red lines for the lobbies and and for and elevations for a massive complex in boston which is built right. um and that's what i spent a year working on this is all by hand drawings and mm-hmm. and um but you know it was very it was kind of exciting to be there um, I, I can't say I learned a lot from Philip Johnson per se himself, mm-hmm. but I did learn about just, you know, the um, work ethos and, um, you know, how how thoroughness is important and all of that and how drawing is important because you really had to draw every mm-hmm. line meant something. And I, t- and I tell young staff today, even though you're drawing on a computer, every line means something, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did learn a lot <clears throat> and... Um, and, and and I think it did help, you know. The I've I've given a lot of <clears throat> a lot of thought as to the, you know, the how how architectural firms are started, um, and you know, I actually my my second year in New York, I approached uh, one of my professors at Columbia University was Bill Pedersen, one of the founders of uh-huh. Con Pedersen Fox, and um, my friend and I, Sonia Chow and I, we approached Bill Pedersen and said, hey. Um, your 10th anniversary is coming up in a couple of years. Um, we would like to produce a monograph on on your work. And they said, that sounds like a plan. We took, they gave us collateral. We took it to Rizzoli International and Rizzoli agreed to publish the book. And so the next year we spent um, interviewing them, editing, writing essays on on all their projects. And we, and we got a book published by Rizzoli on their work. And, oh, wow. Um, so that was my second year in New York and as much of a learning experience as my first year at Philip Johnson. Um, yeah. One thing about a, being a young sort of whippersnapper with full access to a firm, mm-hmm. um, we got to meet the partners, talk to all the partners. We got to go wherever we want in the firm. And, and I was a sponge absorbing everything. This is a highly successful young firm that, that 10 years into their work was doing major buildings and major mm-hmm. projects. And then today they're a massive firm. So, um, so it was, that was a great learning experience. That's, and, that's very, that's a very insightful move to make as a young architect. What was it that um, kind of gave you that idea to do that? 
you know, I don't know. We were just brainstorming uh, one, I don't know, one way, one day and said, uh, let's see if they'll do it. You know, my, my friend Sonia is actually um, always more involved and in, interested in academics. I was always more in, interested in the actual pragmatic, prag, pragmatic nature of architecture. I wanted to have mm -hmm. my own firm. Mm -hmm. That was from day one. And um, and Sonia today is a is a um, I think she's the head of the the architecture school in Miami, and um, and so, but we thought it would be a great idea, a great learning experience, and it definitely was. Mm -hmm. And um, so you know, having done that, I've I've often thought about and advise and mentor young architects. You know, there's many ways to start your own firm. A classic way, like Con Pedersen Fox was they all worked for 10, 15 years in other firms and and left with one or two clients and mm -hmm. big clients and started with big projects. I started with little jobs and took years and years and years to evolve them and grow the practice. And and so there's there's definitely the two approaches to how to start your own office. Well, it's, 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 it's very interesting. I've often see the same sort of thing. Um, you know, you've got either people who start practice very, very young and then, you know, cut your teeth and work on lots of smaller projects. Or then there's the practices that get started with somebody who's, you know, mid 40s, for example, and they've worked at a larger practice. They pinch a few clients, perhaps. And even better than that, they get to take a team with them who've already been working with each other. And, you know, they've got systems in place and, you know, we, we often see businesses like that can grow very, very quickly, um, which sounds like what happened at KPF. That's exactly what they did. And that's exactly what I didn't do. Um, and, um, you know, the third classic way would be, but it's happened so seldom is to win an actual competition for something big. Um, <laughs> but that's, you know, the rare path. It does happen, but it's the rare path in, in life. Yeah. So. So my approach was the slow and steady, you know, honing my craft, as Malcolm Gladwell said, you know, getting my 10,000 hours in. And, um, and I did that and, and, mm -hmm. and incrementally built it up over the years. So, so your first projects were all residential. Um, and w w when was it that you started to move into other, other sectors and how did you start to branch out and diversify the portfolio? So I think I started in, uh, it was a good 10 years or more because I started in 1987 and in um, 2003, we did the first Presbyterian Church of Encino. So there's, right. there's a bit of time. Before that, I had done um, some office interiors for some of my residential clients and smaller projects, never a ground up office building, uh, you know, uh, just, crappy, some crappy stuff, a car wash remodel. I'm trying to think back. I mean, really stuff that, that, um, you know, just learning the craft, paying my yeah. dues. Um, the houses, on the other hand, I started with a brand new house and then a second brand new house and then immediately went down and did some kitchen remodels. And then I got a third brand new house. And so the houses actually had a nice trajectory <clears throat> and, and, um, every year was doing some new houses and so it wasn't bad um at all but mm -hmm. the goal was to really grow for me i always wanted to do um, other work and and to this day we really i really love being multidisciplinary um <clears throat> it's actually been a very good um method for us to to um mitigate against any downturns in one sector or another and mm -hmm. um and and so we you know we and it keeps things very interesting it has a lot of other sort of complications when running a firm um, which we could get into if you're interested but you know when you're a, a single market firm with sort of one product type or two product types um you can you can maintain a staff that really is equipped and experienced in that product type you know, we were talking about it the other day in the office. We've got such a diverse array that we've got. Sometimes it's hard for us to move people around the office because they just have no experience in another project product type that we're doing. Yeah. Uh, and so even though that sector might slow down and we want to move them out, there, there's a lot of retooling and relearning. 
and even convincing them that they are interested in doing the other projects, you know, so they're, so those are, you know, other complications with coming. So, but I'd rather take the diverse firm with, with the, uh, the benefit of, of um, always interesting, keeps it interesting, keeps our exploration strong um, and, and then also helps a little bit on the, uh, on the downside of, of any one of the sectors. But let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, preparing or planning for a recession. Now, with, with 37 years worth of experience running a, a practice, you would have weathered your way through um, a, a number of different recessions. And obviously, that's, the recession is something that people are talking about happening right now. We're either, we're, we're either in one or there's one eminent. Um, it can produce a lot of panic, a lot of fear. Um how have you how has your strategy for planning for recessions or weathering your way changed over the last four decades well right certainly four decades later or, or three and a half almost four decades later i'm way more experienced <clears throat> and i have a lot more wisdom um if i could rewind my life with the same knowledge base and do it again would be fantastic. But, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but uh, so I'm looking, we're looking and planning for this recession that we might or might not be in or might be coming. We don't know mm -hmm. very differently from previously in 93, 94, you know, I, I was a very small office at that point um, with, with, with very little work. In fact, that recession, I think I earned the, low, the lowest amount of money in my entire life. Um, but but I had everything was so small that you could just weather the storm easily in that regard. Yeah. And, um, you didn't have a lot, a lot of mouths to feed and big expenses and things like that. Mm -hmm. Then came the 2008 downturn, which lasted a good 10 years. There we we were we had a, a number of very high end single family residences, which, generally speaking, those that clientele and still to this day, is basically immune from recession. I mean, generally speaking, not everybody yeah. is, but um, and so why and we were still growing our other um, our other non residential work at that point, but it did take a little bit of a slowdown. <clears throat> but the, res the the single family carried us really well. We were a smaller firm. I mean, maybe we were 15 people back then, and um, and with these big houses, big expensive houses um, on, on on the boards and in construction, helped us there completely. And um, and then um, then then we've had since then it's been smooth sailing as everybody knows mm -hmm. until now. Um, right. So now we've been, you know, with, with coronavirus, there was a very different kind of uh, impact on us. It wasn't a true recession. It was sort of, so um, we, 2020, we had so much work carrying over from 2019 that, um, so while some projects were stopped, mostly office interior projects, um, other projects the clients were well committed. The funds were there. Um, the world still, there was still a rosy optimism that we would get vaccine, vaccines that would cure and solve the world's problems. And that would be in 2021. And um, so 2020 was actually a banner year. We had a fair amount of work, which some new work, but mostly carryover work. And we maintained our entire staff. We didn't lose a single person. Wow. We were very committed to our staff and keeping the team intact. And we managed to weather. And then 2021 came and the vaccines were invented, but they were not the magic elixir that actually solved all our problems. I'm, I'm just saying what everybody maybe yeah, knows. Yeah. And, um, and 2021 was actually the slow beginning of, of leading up to where we are today. <clears throat> Projects were not being turned on at all. Clients were in a, in this no man's land of not knowing where we're going, where the world's going, where coronavirus is going. Um, so we, we we did pick up work, but it was not at you know, the pace before coronavirus. It was not right. at the size of the project, but we and we we're scrappy and diverse, and so we kept 
kept it going. That was 2021. 2022, which is the year we're in now, the year we're about to end, um, actually, I think has been the hardest year of this three-year sec- disruption to our world. Um, we, you know, the vaccines did not cure anything. In fact, yeah. the, the influx of money um, caused other problems, hyperinflation. Mm-hmm. Um, and now we're so, but where I'm going with this is at the beginning of this year, in February, when Russia, when Russia invaded, and we were still having um, the beginnings of uh, really difficult times with China. Mm-hmm. So the writing for me was on the wall. I, we just didn't know when, and that's when I personally started. I wasn't the only one, of course, but but started really talking about it within the office and what can we do to to stave off some big crisis. Um, so one, we, we're already doing about 25% of our, of our book is medical work. Right. Um, <clears throat> for some of the local hospitals here in LA, really good clients um, and really good work, but not actual hospital work. Um, um, because that's a certain certification here in the state of California. It's much more yeah. complex. Um, but but periphery work, doctors' offices, urgent cares, I mean, um, new ground-up buildings as well as in- interiors for these hospitals, and solid work, and it just seemed to be such a steady flow of work. You know, we're very conscientious. We're good designers. We're we one of our, our our sort of mottos is we hold our clients hands as much as they need holding and that came out of the residential model by the way right the single family residential and we just translated that into all our other work and our big institutional clients they like that you know they they like the fact that they could call us up whenever they wanted whatever they want we were so nimble and we could turn around the work and turn get answers and and so that work um just has remained steady, very steady and solid. In fact, we've been growing it this year um, just by, through servicing a couple of existing clients and growing those existing clients. But it's also led us to say we should really try and expand that sector. Um, easier said than done, by the way. Um, mm-hmm. Highly competitive sector, um, especially when you get into actual hospital work. We're you know, this is not this is not for little architects. Uh, the big medical work. This is this is the big architects are involved. Really big players, um, national firms, big footprints. Low um, liability involved and framework agreements involved and in, in that kind of stuff. <clears throat> yes, and just major experience needed. Yeah, you know, major experience, and it's and it becomes highly technical work. The the aesthetic side of it is dramatically shrunk. The technical side is hugely expanded. Um, you know, especially if you're just working on the inside of an existing hospital. You know, you're mm-hmm. you're moving co- uh, equipment, you're moving a plug, you're doing this, that. There's 15 consultants, and it's all technical, and it's all under special jurisdiction in the state of California. So. So <clears throat> that is not something you just say, I'm going to expand my medical footprint um, because it's, it's, going to, it's recession-proof. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not the only one thinking that. And I'm competing against 15 massive national firms with very, very deep uh, tentacles into this field. So, but we, we really do want to expand into it and have committed to do it. And um, and we have our, one of our clients, I'm not going to mention the name, but they're a very well-known hospital here in West LA, um, a private hospital, very big. Um, they've said to us numerous times, Trevor, uh, if you have Oshpod experience, that's the agency that governs hospitals, um, we would love to give you work, um, mm-hmm. That more of that work, not just the, the other stuff you're doing. So we've been trying to... Um, very deliberately grow that um, that sector. So how does one grow it is by hiring somebody with that experience um, or by, by trying to merge with or purchase a company that has experience. Right. Um, and we're, um, this is, you know, we've, we're, 
quietly this year been looking to do one or the other or both. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and we're, and it's a slow process. Um, it's not, you know, it's a little bit of the catch 22 when you're a, um, a medium size or a smaller architect compared to the big, big giants out there. You want to hire somebody with this experience and they say, fine, I, I'll, you know, maybe I'll come work for you, but you got no work. What am I going to do? Twiddle my thumbs all day? <laughs> okay, so, yeah, so um, you've got you to try and pace it out. Like, would we win the work first? But you can't win the work without having the experience. And then the person, you can't get the experience without winning the work. Exactly. So we're, we're in that sort of interesting and um, um, situation right now. Mm-hmm. But we're not giving up, um, and we're we're actually exploring opportunities to to buy another firm that just small small firms that just do medical that have staff and personnel that have this experience. So so while nothing is public out there, you'll be the first one I'm actually telling. Yeah. Um, we're we're exploring these avenues, and we think that that is the route to go. Many firms have grown by acquisition. Mm-hmm. Um, I have no personal experience doing it. But we're um, but we're we're looking forward as a firm. We're not. Mm-hmm. We could just stay comfortably, to quote Pink Floyd, comfortably numb. Um, but we're not. We're just, um, you know, and keep our firm where it is. We can be hovering around thirty-five people, a little bit up, a little bit down, doing nice work. Um, but but we're, you know, I've got young partners who are also ambitious. Mm-hmm. I'm 62 years old, but I'm I'm not ready to to hang up the throw the pencil away, and um, so we're we're looking to how can we grow, how can we keep the firm dynamic, how can we um, you know increase our presence in sectors that we believe will be a little more more yeah. immune to some recession. So that that's a very good strategy. What you're talking about there, you know, of, of acquisition, and I've I've spoken to a number of um, and worked with a number of clients who have gone through um, the process of acquiring another company. Um, what? How do you begin to do something like that? How's your? What does your process start to look like? And and how do you evaluate your own business to be able to make such an acquisition? And how do you evaluate another company? You know, um, there are definitely brokers out there um, mm-hmm. that do it. I don't have a rela- I did not have a relationship, or don't have a relationship with any. But I mean, literally, I got a random email because I'm on these email lists now as an established, somewhat established company, mm-hmm. and I happened to see one that had a medical company, so I pro- approached them and and um, and we're in early early on discussion. So. How do you you know how do you find these companies by 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 a little bit of luck, but it's not luck because you make your own luck. You got to put yourself out there and you got to look, and by looking, now you know I know if you want to buy a house, you might you might look at a, at twenty houses before you find the house you want, and even then if you can get it, it's a it's these you know it's a tough proposition. So so I'm assuming that we will do due diligence and and evaluate it, but. Um, but it's a highly entrepreneurial um, proposition. Um, I am an entrepreneur. I'm not risk. Ad- I am risk uh, a risk taker. Yeah. Um, but as I get older, it's a much more calculated risk. There's no question about it. So, um, you know, you buy a firm that might or might not even be in your backyard. It might be in another city, close, wherever. Um, and how do you staff it? You know, you're buying a firm from somebody that wants, generally the firms are being sold because the principals want out or they want to retire or they want whatever. And then, but but you you need the principal involved because they are the experience. Um, yes, the book and backlog is important, but it's useless in this case for us without the experience because we want that experience. That's what we're buying, quite frankly. So yeah. it's... Um, there's a lot of um, uh, uncharted territory for us, having never done it. But but we're kind of some somewhat sophisticated, and we're very analytical. We're um, you know at least we have 37 years of experience behind us, business experience, weathering all sorts of storms and growing the firm. 
So I think we can do it. And so that is one strategy. We're pursuing both strategies, trying to hire hire the right people as well yeah. as trying to um, try to purchase a, a, a small size firm. So, so focusing in on the on the medical um, sector, that's that's one part of your recession strategy. Is there any yeah. other sectors which you think? I mean, you know, so you're saying private residential at the very high end is usually pretty robust through uh, through a recession. Is there anything else that you'll be looking at or positioning yourself around? Yes, I mean, we do a lot of res- uh, religious institutional work mm-hmm. uh, as well. Um, born out of that first church project that I mentioned. Um, mm-hmm. And um, and that actually led to some synagogue work, um, interestingly and ironically. So, you know, we're, so we do, um, we do, and then that a lot of um, synagogues or religious institute and religious institutions have schools associated with them. So it's not just the house of worship, it's the schools as well. And um, so we've done over the years a number of these kind of projects with which have um, houses of worship and schools, and and um, and so we and right now we have you know a, a fantastic project for an early education center at one of the Jewish day schools um, synagogue day schools here in LA. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a big project. I don't remember twenty five thirty million of construction. Um, and, and, um, and we're doing several others. And so that sector is affected by donations and donations are affected by recession. There's no question about it, but generally speaking, these institutions are on a longer plan. They're, um, they're, they're, they've fundraised. Many of them have fundraised. They never stop fundraising yeah. and they've, fundraise and they've built up some uh, kitty and they still, um, whether it's deferred maintenance or whether it's an expansion, they need to do the work. So we're, we're definitely in that sector and, um, and we'll fight hard for it. In fact, we noticed something. We were invited for a, a relatively small um, synagogue and um, preschool here in West LA about four months ago, we were invited to submit an RFQ. Yep. And, and we submitted one. And in fact, it's, the project seems so small that um, I, even though ironically, my kids went there to preschool, actually. Um, and, but I had some other engagement that I didn't want to move around another meeting or something. So I said to one of my young, younger partners, Marco, who handles our religious work, you go, the first meeting was everybody arrived and did a walkthrough, okay? And then you had to send your, your qualifications. And so Marco showed up and there must, he said there must have been 10 or 15 architects there that all showed up. And, and we're not just talking about the moms and pops of architecture. We're talking about established LA architecture firms that, that, so he came back and we talked about it and we said, okay, this, there's a reason for this, that these firms are there because everybody's worrying about the, re- the next year, the recession. Yeah. Is it coming? This is a job to get. This is a job that will continue. It's not going to not happen. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so that's the sign. That's an interesting sign of the time. that yeah. we, we kind of theorized as to why it was happening. Competition was stiff. I'm happy to report we won the project. Congratulations. Um, and, um, you know, with some top names in LA that we were finalists with. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, you know, but the, the moral of that story is it seems like firms, not only us, are aggressively and hungrily going after that kind of work mm-hmm. now, you know. Um, so, you know, I think that's a little lesson that we're, we're seeing. So in, in your in the, this kind of recession plan, diversification is is quite a key element and making sure that you've got your fingers in different um, sectors that are going to be robust through any kind of economic um, changes. And you mentioned earlier that there's it's not it's not plain sailing having a diverse portfolio. And I'd be interested to dig into that a little bit more. Um, you know, obviously, from a marketing perspective, um, you know, you 
being perceived as an expert is one thing and obviously you can be perceived in, in an ex, as an expert in multiple disciplines but it takes something it really takes something to kind of get that clarity of messaging to a specific sector and you know this messaging over here on this sector and make sure that the two don't get muddled up together what what are some of the problems that you've experienced with diversification and how have you surmounted them if you like sure uh, you know Definitely being a, a market specialist in one niche specialty um, is, is, is easier. Is, it's easier to run a practice and it's easier to compete for that particular work. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and we've noticed even you know, when we're competing for school projects, we're often competing against firms that only do school work, period. Um, And there are a few of them here in LA. Um, So we're at a disadvantage on that playing field. Um, But we we pitch our ability to design. We pitch our ability to shepherd our clients through moments of key change, Um, you know, and... Um, and we have lots of examples that we can cite and how we've helped clients. Um, so we are, we're, we're um, pitching our, our other attributes. It goes without saying we can design and we have designed a school, so. But, mm-hmm. um, but while we haven't done 100 schools in 30 years and we've done five, we, it's enough experience to get us, um, to, get us to be your architect. Um, yeah. So it's it, it's always a little bit of a disadvantage. There's no question. But now we we would love to do ho- some hospital work, but we know we can't compete on that because of the mm-hmm. other reasons we discussed earlier on. For we'd also like to do life science buildings. Now there's another sector that is growing exponentially right now. That is, we believe, also recession. Uh, nothing's actually recession proof, but a recession proof, we'll call it. Um, but we've never done a life science building. Can we do one? Of course we could do one. We can do it in our sleep. It's not, it's just another kind of, we're building, we're very methodical. We're very analytical. We have a, we're highly professional. And so it's just another set of problems to solve, but you can't, but convincing the client of that is always the problem is always yeah. the, the top of side. Um, you know, so then on the, on the staffing, yeah, um, sophisticated clients want to, and they do read the bios of everybody that you put forward. They, right. they, they, you know, you can't just sort of pull the wool over their eyes. It it just doesn't work that way, you know. With with um, for real jobs, for big jobs, you know. So so we we do have people in our office that are special specialists who have a lot of experience in each one of these uh, the several types of project types we do and yes we can still mix and match some people but but not but but lower on the project scale not higher up on the on the management of the project so um but yeah we do that we try and juggle and 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 tell a good story Mm -hmm. that is very important a good story about us and why us um you know and, and <laughs> by and large, it works. We don't win every project, but by and large, it works. When um, you're working with a client and you're kind of putting them at ease and explaining the, the you know, you're kind of helping them understand that you're not a risk. And, you know, we see more and more risk averse clients. And obviously, as you get bigger, multi-headed corporate clients, there's often a person or a project lead or um, a manager whose whose sole job is to you know manage the risk of the project, and they've got superiors to answer to, and then the architect is answering to that person. There's all these sorts of chains of command that become quite complicated. How do you? What have you found is really successful in just putting a client or a prospective client at ease that you're not going to be a risk, and certainly you know, when you're moving into new sectors. You know, it's really convincing a client that you are there as their trusted advisor. Right. Um, that's important. Um, a lot of a lot of the win on larger projects that we might not have huge amounts of experience are born out of relationship. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, if, if you've developed a relationship um, prior and, and you can um, cement that relationship by, by really uh, appealing on the personal end, then you're, you're going to, your chances of winning that job are so much more increased. In fact, job, you know, I know the theory and it doesn't always put it happen. Okay. But, but many jobs are won before the jobs are even uh, issued for RFQ and RFP. Okay. Mm-hmm. I hate to say it. It just sounds dirty and corrupt, but it's the absolute truth. You know, yeah. um, I'm not a golfer per se, but deals are made on the golf course. And then you know that the company is going to issue an RFP and an RFQ and you start planning and preparing for it and working quietly with the client behind the scenes before, before the RFP is issued saying, Mm -hmm. you know, you should make sure you ask about this, make sure you do that in your RFP, make sure you, and then the RFP comes, you you know, all about it. You're ready. You're, you're, and that, That happens. That happens all the time. It happens with a, with big companies. Um, so um, you know. So how to position yourself to get in front of the RFP and RFQ is the key to getting the work. Easier said than done. Not easy. Yes. Bottom yeah. line. Not well, easy. Well, well, this is this is very interesting. Man. So many of the practices that I've spoke, certainly in the US. Um, when I've been talking to, you know, kind of the presidents or the business development leads in those companies have spoken about exactly this, um, you know, becoming a conversation partner, not a commodity, um, and getting yourself upstream before the client goes to competition. Because at that point of competition, and you haven't heard about it, somebody else has. And, and it's, and it's kind of like, you know, if you're not being proactive in developing that relationship, beforehand then you're at a disadvantage so so how do you how do you ethically do this how do you 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 maintain those relationships and and what what sorts of things have you found that work for you guys you know um it really works best with existing clients right um you know like our large couple of our large medical clients we're there they will call us or call one of my partners or one of the team. Can you run over and look at the space? Can you do this? Can you do that? And and we do. We drop everything. We're there. Mm-hmm. There's never a discussion of how much are we charging. We don't charge, to be honest. Mm-hmm. We're just their trusted advisor. Yeah, this space is going to work. Let me go back to the office, throw up, whip up the quick plan to see if you can actually fit or not fit. Or, or let me just check the zoning out for you quickly. You know, can you actually build what you want to build there? And um, and we're doing that not only with that client, but with several of our clients all the time. So you're you're really there for them. And then when it becomes a project, um, if depending on the client and the client's internal workings, um, they might be have to put it out to a bid, competitive bid. Some some of our clients are publicly traded. There's a lot of you know disclosure they have to, but you're still on the inside track on that. You're um, you've really established the relationships. You're and then sometimes the client will just bid wave it. Okay, that's mm-hmm. stuck music to an architect's ears. Okay, um, it's your job. <laughs> you you you're the chosen one. <laughs> you're the chosen one. You know we're going to bid wave it. We're not going to go out a bid. So, you know, we really work hard on developing the client relationships. The hardest thing in business development is getting the brand new client. Mm. And, but once we have it, we're very good at, at working with our clients. We're, we're, uh, you know, we're high integrity architects. We're good people. We do what we say. That's been my mantra in my entire career and in my life outside of the office, you know, um, do what you say. If you promise yeah. something, you may you you just don't go to sleep for a week to make sure that that promise is met. You, you never, never, never budge on that, and that's how we operate here. And and so that you know goes a long way to developing a strong relationship with our clients. Mm-hmm. So those are that's what's working for us right now. Could we figure out how to? 
grow more brand new clients. Yeah, we're trying to figure it out every day and we, we're trying, but that, that's what we do. How has um, growing with your clients been part of your kind of business strategy, if you like? So oft, often I'll speak to architects and, you know, it's hard for them to, you know, start working with a developer, for example, who's got an architect that they've been working with for 15, 20 years. Very difficult to break into that kind of relationship. But then what I have heard works very well is is architects finding a developer that perhaps is at the same level if you like, as them or are kind of less experienced or, and then they've, you know, there's a kind of, there's more of a natural synergy. Has that been uh, an approach that you've either intentionally developed or unintentionally? It's intentional. We have, um, I have younger partners. I have three partners Mm -hmm. um, who are younger. They're in their, you know, mid forties to young fifties. Um, And they, it's much easier for them to be working with clients around their age or even just a little younger than them, quite frankly, Mm -hmm. than it is, say, for me to be working with the younger clients. And there's just a a greater affinity and kinship. So they are growing those relationships and growing the business with as the as the younger client grows. So that's definitely a strategy and an important strategy. Um, and then the other one is growing the clients that we have. That's a huge part of our business. Um, you know, um, and I think it, at one stage we had like s- almost 70% repeat business. Um, wow. and, and it, but, but that's not the statistic today. Um, but we really, really try to, to develop, to develop those clients, keep it in the family. Mm-hmm. Uh, even the single family houses we've done you know a couple of clients their main house their their second house their daughter's house their whatever you know so if you can um grow that and, and it's all relationship it's all integrity reputation mm. um and that's the key to it you know great but that um, having said all of that that can maintain a nice solid firm yeah but to then catapult you to another level or a bigger level is is a is a, a different proposition, I believe. And we're at that point now where we're saying to ourselves, okay, um, it's not really about the number of people, by the way, but but how do we get to fifty people, or how do we get to um, to instead of fifty projects in the office in any one time in the month, how do we get to twenty five projects in the office? but all triple the size. Mm -hmm. Um, That dynamic makes a huge difference to the functioning of a firm. When you've got a lot more projects that are all smaller, it's a tougher firm to manage. And then, and and then when you have, you know, fewer, larger projects. So, so making that leap is a very difficult proposition. Um, And and then, then they say in the growth of a firm, you know, you can, as you grow from zero to about 25, you can be very, very profitable. 25 to 35, the, you're growing, but the profit is not growing as much. And it takes to get to about 50 before you start hitting more profit. Up again. Yeah. You know, so that leap from where we are to the next step is the difficult leap. Yeah, so that transitional stage. Um, talking of transitions and and kind of growth, you you mentioned there you've you've got four partners, three partners plus myself, three partners plus yourself. Could you talk a little bit about that process of you know nurturing partners or how they became partners? Was was it a a very clear um, career trajectory for them from the outset or? Did, how did you help structure it and nurture them? And then what was the actual process like of bringing them on into becoming partners? And maybe some of them, are, I'm assuming they're equity holders as partners. And Sure. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not getting younger. I work extremely hard. And do I want to be doing this in 10 years' time at this pace? No. Mm-hmm. I've said that to openly and it's fun and it's interesting. You know, I've, I've got a lot of contemporaries here in LA, um, well-known names. You've, you've heard of them. 
all around my age, all having the same thought process. Okay. Um, and so where, about five years ago, I said to myself, um, I've got a great firm. I can keep it going and then I can close the doors. Okay. And we'll disappear mm -hmm. or, um, or we, or we embark on, I embark on a deliberate transition plan so that I can change the mom and pop proverbial mom and pop business into an actual business that can survive beyond me. Yeah. And, and so that was what I decided to do. Um, and you know, I, um, I had, I had hired a, a lawyer who's really well versed in this field and we created a complete new corporate structure corporate bylaws with um which allowed other partners to come in and, and had a process for me to divest of my shares so that was the first thing to do i've also um with this in mind been been really um very open to my staff for 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 several years now that and i tell this even to new hires when we come in when when i meet them that that there's a plate full of opportunity here in our firm and it's, and you can eat from it as much as you want to, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and so if, if somebody wants to be a partner in this firm and they're ambitious and they can contribute in a dynamic way, there's no reason why they can't. And that is, so that is sort of the, the, the ethos in the firm, the corporate ethos, if you will. And, and so we started by, um, three of these, my three partners now were, um, met all those criteria. They were ambitious. They were hustling. We uh, spoke to them about how, how the next steps and where the future could go. You know, we, we then created, we never had any convoluted titles. Like then they became an associate and then a senior associate and then an associate principal. And then a, an equity partner. I've actually been retooling this right now, and um, we we're now got a few more rungs. So we can be a practice leader, then an associate, mm -hmm. then a senior associate, then a principal, and then a partner. So a principal does not have equity, but a, but it's very high up in the firm. So so yeah. we've been working hard for years now. I've been working on on this, and and um, and and then. So these three partners that I have now really rose up. They're enthusiastic. They, they, um, they um, do such a good job uh, at nurturing and, and building and, and bringing in new work from existing clients and all that stuff um, that they became partners. Part of an important part about being a partner in a firm, an equity partner in a firm, is that the pie is only so big and you want a yeah. piece of the pie, the pie needs to grow. It's very simple, um, you know. And so you want a piece of this pie, sure, but you got to help grow this pie, or you got to be growing the pie before you get a piece of it. Mm -hmm. So um, and and it is working. And and then the other tricky part for for many um, founding partners of firms is how and when to let go. Quite mm -hmm. frankly, um, and and that. You know, we worry about everything. Okay, well, if I'm if I'm not designing everything, is it going to just go? To, you know, I'm going to get some terrible product out there. It's not going to represent the name and the brand, and or or there's going to be screw ups and affect the liability or a hundred other things. But you have to let go. You have to delegate. You have to trust. And that is the that's the only way that that you know if I if if this what I'm saying is going to be heard by a smaller younger architects, that is the one way to grow. You've got to be able to trust people, yeah. and delegate and delegate a lot, and um, and so we've been doing doing that, and we've been doing it deliberately, um, really trying to I, I call it you know if we're if sort of the pyramid with me at the top, so to speak, or the partners at the top, mm -hmm. how to push the responsibility down and at the same mm -hmm. time, how to grow the bottom 
So because there's a lot of young talent in the office that are ambitious, that want to grow. Yeah. And if you if they're just sort of they're doing ho hum task, redlining drawings all day, they're not going to reach their potential as quickly as they should, or they might leave you, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So we're working from the bottom up and from the top down to to grow the, the middle of a firm. Um, in fact, I was talking to another firm the other day, and they, their problem is a bunch of guys in their 60s, smallish practice. They have no option at this point to shut, but to shut down because they have no middle management that can take the take the mm -hmm. take the reins and and carry the firm on. So, so that's uh, so planning for transition is very important if you want to. Mm -hmm. Many architects just say, yeah, "I'm not interested. I'll just." shut down and retire and do whatever. But, well, well, but that wasn't the, the strategy. There's also a sales job here involved in enrolling other people to become partners. Um, how, you know, what do some of your partners, for example, what do they see the benefits of being, certainly being an equity holder? Because it, obviously it comes with more responsibility. Um, you know, the, the obvious would probably be more, there's more money and finance involved. But how how have you kind of presented it as being, you know, this is an opportunity. You know, with the, the my three partners now, and it doesn't mean to say we might have other partners in the future, mm -hmm. but the, with my three partners now, you know, going back, they they wanted to be partners. Okay, I don't know if they actually understood what it really meant, um, but they wanted to be partners. They now certainly do. Okay, um, yes. and but but in general, um, with all our staff with our entire team um while money and compensation is important it's not the highest thing of importance okay um people want to feel valued people want to feel that they are really making a contribution we're talking to architects after all you know what drove us into this profession in the first place you know not you know, that I'm going to be a millionaire by 30 years old. No, um, it, it was the passion for the work, the art of the business. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and so so while money, you need money to pay the rent and, and the bills, and it is important. And, and as young architects get older, the money actually does become more important because you've got families and you've got all the other responsibilities. But the big driver is to the, to satisfaction is, are they doing good work? Are they valued? Are they contributing? And and so a partner has those exact sentiments, but mm -hmm. more. Am I bringing projects to the table? Am I bringing clients? Am I are my clients really valuing me? Not just the firm, and or am I getting invited to speak at some public events and things? And so so the platform grows for partners um, much easier than if they're not partners. Uh, the ability to bring in work so much easier. If you're a partner, you pull out your, mm -hmm. your proverbial business card and say, I'm a partner. Let's talk business. You're, you're heard. Whereas if you're not a partner, much tougher. So, yeah. um, so there's a lot of real good reasons why, why people aspire to and want to be partners. But uh, having said that, my experience, I would say most don't want to be that. Mm -hmm. Many people are just not that ambitious. They're very satisfied in their lives. They don't equate the two together. Yes. Okay? Yeah, 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 absolutely. But it's a very different kind of drive and ambition to, mm -hmm. to want to own the firm yes. or be a partner in the firm that own, and owns it. So, um, well, this, this is an interesting, uh, interesting one. You know, and I often will speak with uh, younger partners in, in transition um, you know, in, in, a, in a firm and perhaps they've agreed to something or to some sort of buyout of a firm. And I, I guess the question is, we, it, it's not always clear what it means to be a partner. So from your perspective, what, what does it mean to be a partner? What is, what is a partner? What, what, why does it need that kind of extra level of ambition, if you like, or what does it mean to be a partner? I think the, you know, on on one level, I'm just going to say you have to bring in work. Okay. But, <laughs> and that is true and that is important. 
Yes. But it but it's not as important and not as and and not worth it if you're not a people person. If you're mm -hmm. not um if you you don't have a really good ability to under to manage people and understand them and work with them and delegate to them um and then be a people person with your clients on the other end to bring in the work. So that's the number one thing that I'm interested in and look at, you know, with, mm -hmm. with the, the skills and of the, of a partner, definitely having some business acumen is important. You know, we are running a firm by the time, you know, any young firm grows up a little bit into a business that is even talking about having partners, not just your buddy that you came out of school with and started the firm or your wife that you married, you know, your, your wife architect that you started your firm. But if you're growing up and you're, you're at this point, uh, at a point where you're really looking at it, you're now very much in the business of architecture and as, and not just in the art of architecture. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that taking that transition is fundamental to growing the business. Yes. You're, you're not forgetting the art of architecture. You're not forgetting your craft, but you you know you'll only be that small size as long as you don't forget that you can be the world's most talented architect but you've got to embrace the business of architecture and the business of architecture is not just you know doing the accounting it's um it's it's the um savviness the street smarts the um the uh the way to navigate people navigate clients and all those other things like how to negotiate a fee don't shortchange yourself. The, the biggest problem that young architects make, and if I look at myself, I'm, I'm there. I started my firm very young, is undervaluing yourself um, because you're too, you don't have the experience, you're shy, you're, um, you know, my, my, my young daughter who's a budding director is doing mu music videos in a brutally, brutally competitive business in Hollywood yeah. here in LA. Yeah, and um, and she's working for nothing, and it's like makes me so sad. I, I see her, and and I constantly telling her, "Don't undervalue your services." You mm -hmm. and architects don't undervalue your services. So for a young architect, I think that's super important. When you get when you grow up a little bit, it's not about that anymore because every job we get is a competition. So mm -hmm. it's a different paradigm now. We're we're competing and we're competing against the Genslers of the world as well as the, the other architects. So it's not just, um, you know, we do value our services. We know what our value is, but now we're, we have downward pressures from competition. So it's, if anybody said architecture is easy there, it's not easy. So. <laughs> Brilliant. I think that's the perfect place to conclude the conversation there, Trevor. Thank you so much. That was a, a really, really insightful uh, conversation and really drawing upon 37 years of hard-won business experience and a lot of wisdom that you've shared with, uh, with, with us and the, and the audience. So thank you so much for being on the show today. It's a pleasure and I uh, look forward to, to, to hearing from you more. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.